13 Lectures on General History of China by Lu Zheng Chapter 3 The Spring and Autumn and the Warring States Periods in the History of the Development of Chinese Civilization. The advanced cultures of the Spring and Autumn period and the Warring State period can be called the original culture in recorded history. Each forming a complete societal system with their rich contributions. During the Spring and Autumn period, the powerful feudal lords had launched wars to achieve hegemony by holding the King of Zhou hostage and acting in his name. The changes in social life shook the foundations of the political and legal system. From then on, the old ritual system began to fall into decline. While the Zhou royal court sank into a weak state in the spring and autumn period, several large princely great states started to launch wars and hold rituals by themselves. One. The rise of power of various princes this was a critical time in the history of China. The spring and autumn period 770 BC to 476 BC lasted for fully 294 years. In this period, the infethment system and the aristocratic regime gradually collapsed and new changes appeared in society. The Warring States period 475 BC to 221 BC lasted for 254 years. The centralized states in pre-Qin times were formed and merged, and as a result a national unified centralized empire was established, the Qin Empire. With the development of private land ownership, New noble landlords emerge, and the society of the spring and autumn period change significantly. The consequences of these changes are reflected in the political strife between private individuals and the royalty. From the time when the capital of the Eastern Zhou dynasty was relocated to Luoyang, 771 BC, up until the middle of the spring and autumn period. Private individuals gained growing economic and political power. Infighting between them grew intense. And in this way domestic ministers represented by Qing Da Fu gradually gained political power over the regime as the royal families in all vassal states were weakened to varying degrees. This strife fell into two kinds. First, there was the strife between the clan and the immediate royalty. Secondly, there was strife between ministers with different surnames and the royalty. Pursuant to the regulations of the Zhou dynasty, the first son of the legal wife was entitled to succeed to the throne. Conversely, all others would be awarded the title of minister as later generations of the clan. They were always struggling for power and profit with the royalty. The states of Liu, Qi, and Jin reveal the most typical examples of feuding between the ministers and the royalty. In the spring and autumn period, the state of Liu was governed by the royal family. Even so, much private power in this area lay in the hands of the Ji, Shu, and Mang clans. All of them developed from a common origin, being descended from Duke Huan of the state of Lu, 711 BC to 694 BC. They defiantly constructed new towns to try and expand their power and political influence. This phenomenon was painstakingly documented in records of the Grand Historian, House of Lu Zhogong by Sima Qian. After the middle of the spring and autumn period, the Tian clan, a new member of the noble class in the state of Qi, 
emerged and gradually gained sufficient power to govern the state, with the result being that they seized the throne. In the state of Jin, the royalty had faded from the stage of history before this period. Likewise, ministers with different surnames slowly took over the state power. For this reason, the state of Jin was separated into the Wei, Han, and Zhao states. This is known to history as the state of Jin separated by three clans, Sanjia Fenjin. This strife reflected an increasingly sharp contradiction between the political system and the social economy. 2. Seven powerful city-states in the early Warring States period, Qin, Qi, Yan, Chu, Zhao, Wei, and Han were the strongest states. Despite holding a vast territory, the state of Yu played an insignificant role at that time, for the strength of that nation was weakened by the Chu. The coexistence of seven strong states was not an accident. Zhao, Wei, Han, and Qi resulted from the gaining of power by ministers in the Jin and Qi states of the spring and autumn period which damaged the patriarchal tradition more thoroughly. Neither the Qin nor the Chu had a rigorous patriarchal system. By the time ancient China entered the Warring States period, the regional central authority, an unprecedented regime, had hatched out from the infestment system. The extensive political reforms that took place in the seven most powerful states, the seven states, led to the transition between the two political systems. A great number of official and private slaves served the society during the Warring States period. Most official slaves were actually criminals. Those who had been enslaved as a criminal penalty were called servants with lifelong servitude to the government, according to the Qin law. In this period, slaves were still presented or bargained with like any other goods, and sati for slaves had not become extinct by that time. Nevertheless, Judging from the main theme of social hierarchy, China had stepped onto the threshold of being a feudal society. Many great changes took place with pioneering achievements in all fields during the Warring States period, and it was also a golden age for academia and culture. Numerous schools of thought existed in different regions of the land, and these were often tied to specific geographical locations. Confucianism was based in the state of Lu and disseminated across the states of Jin, Wei, and Qi. Mohism was developed towards the states of Chu and Qin. Taoism was initiated in the states of Chu, Chen, and Song and was later circulated in the state of Qi. The people of the state of Chu retained a rather primitive religion focused upon the worship of necromancers and ghosts, which influenced the states of Qi and Yan. Later on, the Yin-Yang school or school of naturalists flourished in the state of Qi. However, legalism mainly originated in the states of Wei, Han, and Zhao. Zhao and Lu were the cultural centers in the spring and autumn period. 3. Changes to social life in the spring and autumn and warring states periods The spring and autumn period was labeled as a great revolutionary era of ancient Chinese society. Cities experienced magnificent transformation. The number of cities that rose increases rapidly during the spring and autumn period. 
This increase in the number of cities indicates that political, military, and cultural activities were no longer confined within the capital city or several core cities. The layouts of the cities began to be diversified in the spring and autumn period. The number of cities increased significantly in the Warring States period. Groups of major commercial cities emerged as their economic functions became more significant compared with the past. The following cities became famous metropolitan and commercial centers during that period. There were specialized commercial districts, Shang Yi Shi Ku, within each city in the Warring States period. The commercial districts were surrounded by walls and gates in each direction. In addition, the gates would be closed during the nights and reopened in the mornings. Lindsay, the capital city in the state of Qi, was the largest city and the busiest commercial metropolis of that period. Along with the booming population, Iron farming tools were becoming widely utilized and farming skills advanced, so that the natural countryside and unfarmed lands were cultivated and flourished. Some even becoming new commercial centers. The county became the major political and administrative unit used for controlling rural areas. The concept of provinces, John, was also introduced to the governing system in the Warring States period. Hence, a two-level administrative system, provinces above counties, was put in place for ruling the states. A significant transition which occurred during the Warring States period was that the enfeffment system was replaced by the provinces and counties at local government level. During the spring and autumn period, the powerful states such as Qin and Chu set up a new administrative system of provinces and counties in each of the places they conquered through wars of annexation. The governorships of the provinces and counties were no longer hereditary positions. Rather governors were appointed and dismissed directly by the kings or lords. These governors in the provinces and counties comprised the first bureaucracy in Chinese history. Each year, in the seasons in which farming was dormant, the kings would call their troops for training and practicing of martial arts. According to the commentary of Juliang on the spring and autumn annals, Teaching and learning warfare skills while hunting were considered a major event in etiquette. Being a warrior was a social norm and had become an important part of the male role in spring and autumn society. People during these times <laughs> idolized those heroes who mastered splendid archery and defensive techniques while in their military uniforms. 4. The birth of the landlord class the development of ancient tools for production fell into three categories, the stone, the bronze, and the iron ages. In Chinese history, bronze ware failed to replace stone ware as the main material for tools of production. However, after the birth of iron ware, stone ware soon vanished. This was because iron tools are much sharper than tools made out of stone or bronze. The progress in social productivity made household production possible. The development of a household economy required breaking the bondage of the clan. In addition to continuous wars, land allocation, and industrial and business development, the states were driven into forming a unified state in history. Social reform campaigns in the states of Wei, Chu, Qi, Qin, Han, 
Zhao, and Yan perfectly mirrored the above requirements in politics. For instance, the reforms of Shang Yang, 390 BC to 338 BC, for the Duke Shao of the state of Qin, 361 BC to 338 BC, were noteworthy. The coexistence of seven strong states was not an accident. Zhao, Wei, Han, and Qi resulted from the gaining of power by ministers in the Jin and Qi states of the spring and autumn period, which damaged the patriarchal tradition more thoroughly. Neither the Qin nor the Chu had a rigorous patriarchal system. From this perspective, the reform of the old system was the necessary prerequisite for historical evolution. In the late Warring States period, social reform gave birth to changes in the social hierarchy. At that time, landlords owned land and laborers themselves exploited their surplus labor. The landlord class gradually evolved into a ruling class. It had three sources. First, the nobility, who were in theft with land, expanded the size of their lands and became the earliest <laughs> landlords. Second, bureaucrats and military landlords became squirearchal once lands were awarded to them by the emperor. Third, Successful merchants and usurers were transformed into landlords by annexing lands via trade ties founded upon great success in business and loan sharking. Apart from the landlord and peasant classes, there were also craftsmen, merchants, and slaves. Craftsmen and merchants were separated from the government office and transformed into commodity producers and operators. A great number of official and private slaves served the society during the Warring States period. Most official slaves were actually criminals. Those who had been enslaved as a criminal penalty were called servants with lifelong servitude to the government, according to the Qin law. In this period, slaves were still presented or bargained with like any other goods. Nevertheless, judging from the main theme of social hierarchy, China had stepped onto the threshold of being a feudal society. Many great changes took place with pioneering achievements in all fields during the Warring States period, and it was also a golden age for academia and culture. During the Spring and Autumn period and the Warring States period, the contentions of the 100 schools of thought led to the zenith of the blossoming of Chinese culture in ancient history. 5. The thought and philosophy of this period the blossoming of Chinese thought and culture occurred during the spring and autumn period, 770 to 476 BC, and the Warring States period, 475 to 221 BC. This time witnessed significant social change. A. Confucius Confucius 551 to 479 BC, was the founder of Confucianism. He was a thinker and educator of the late spring and autumn period. The founder of Mohism was Mo Di, circa 468 to 376 BC. He proposed universal love and non-aggression. A succession of new views was added to the 100 schools of thought. Among these Taoism followed Confucianism and Mohism. Taoism learned from Confucianism and Mohism, but at the same time presented its own critique of both. Laozi, circa 571 to 471 BC, was the earliest pioneer of Taoism in the late spring and autumn period. 
During the Warring States period, there existed various schools of thinking, known collectively as the 100 schools of thought. According to their main tenets, the Han Dynasty historian Sima Tan III divided them into six categories, namely, Yin Yang, Confucianism, Mohism, Ming Bian, Legalism, and Morality. Confucius, 551 to 479 BC, was born in Zui, Changping. In the Chinese state of Liu, Chu was his given name and Zhang Ni was his courtesy name. His father died when he was a small child, so he lived a very poor and humble life. As a youth, he worked as an accountant and as a shepherd. Confucius started teaching privately in or around his thirties. At the age of 51, he was commissioned as the officer in charge of Zhang Dou. Later being promoted to director of engineering and then minister of justice. At 57, he led his disciples to expound his ideas in all the small states within central China. Then, at 68 Confucius returned to his hometown in the state of Liu, where he dedicated himself to education. To understand Confucius, we should read the Analects of Confucius. This is a collection of his aphorisms and those of his disciples, compiled by his immediate disciples or by the followers of those disciples, based on their recollections. Confucius's initial contribution to Chinese thought and culture was the collation of the literature of the Western Zhou dynasty, which he also used as teaching materials. The Book of Poetry, the Classic of History, the Book of Rites, the Book of Changes, and the Spring and Autumn Annals are named as the Five Classics, Wu Jing, which form the basis of Confucianism. Confucius's study and collation of the Five Classics is one of his major contributions to the history of Chinese thought and culture. Benevolence, Ren. The book's Zuo's Commentary on the Spring and Autumn Annals, Zuo Zhuan, and Discourses of the States, Guo Yu, both indicate that many people were talking about benevolence, Ren, before and during Confucius's time. He abstracted, summarized, and enriched that concept. This makes benevolence the fundamental category of humanism. Confucius explained many times what constitutes benevolence when talking to his disciples. Benevolence is not based upon the worship of ancestors, but rather upon the rationality of man. It is not centered upon tribal behavior or group behavior, but upon self-cultivation. It is not based upon sacrificing one side for the benefit of the other but upon considering each side's needs. All these features are exemplified in Confucius's statement that benevolence means loving others, when Confucius's disciple named Fan Kai asked him to define what benevolence is. He answered, loving others. To love others means, from one perspective, that do not impose on others what you yourself do not desire. Confucius emphasized that in order to become a self-cultivated gentleman, one should start with one's own hard efforts. He said, if for a single day a man could return to the observance of the rites through restraining himself, then the whole empire would consider benevolence to be his. However, the practice of benevolence depends on oneself alone, and not on others. By saying this, Confucius was proposing the revival of the rites of the Western Zhou dynasty. 
This is Confucius's political ideal. At the same time, Confucius regarded the moral self-cultivation of the emperor as the fundamental requirement for him to be able to govern and pacify the country. Confucius thought that one should observe moral standards in one's life, giving precedence to the doctrine of morality and justice. In this way, one can lead a rich and fulfilled life. The purpose of life should not be reduced to the pursuit of wealth, though everybody wishes to become wealthy. People's desire to become wealthy should be tempered. This tempering of desire is called the doctrine of morality and justice. Confucius contends that gentlemen focus on righteousness, base men focus on gain. Confucius's view elevates the value of the human, and he was the first philosopher in the history of Chinese thought to systematically expound the value of life. Besides this, Confucius went into much in-depth analysis about political and educational ideas. A. Confucius was the most influential thinker and educator to have lived in ancient China. He is unmatched in being the most debated thinker by later generations B. Laozi in the spring and autumn period as well as in the warring states period. Natural philosophy was eventually established by Laozi through his profound exploration of the way of heaven and the way of humanity. His work established a complete theoretical system. According to the records of the Grand Historian, the family name of Laozi was Li and his given name was Er. He was born at Ku Ren Li in Li Village, Ku County, now in the east of Luyi County, Henan Province, under the state of Chu. He occupied the post of archivist, Guanli Changshu, to the Royal Library of the Eastern Zhou Dynasty. He read extensively and integrated knowledge of the way of heaven with the way of humanity and became the most educated philosopher in the later spring and autumn period. He is regarded as the father of Taoism. From a broader perspective, the history of Chinese thought is largely constituted from the further exploration and reconciliation of Confucianism and Taoism. In 1973, the A and B versions of Laozi, retained on silk, were excavated from the Han tombs at Mawengdui, Changsha City, Hunan Province. This discovery makes possible the comparative study of the Laozi on silk and the current version, in order to further comprehend the essence of the philosophy of Laozi. The current version and the version on silk share some common features and there are also differences between the two. In 1993, Part of Laozi on bamboo slips was found among the other bamboo slips which were excavated from the Godian No. 1 Chu tomb in Jingmen City, Hubei Province. The study of this bamboo slip version of Laozi is ongoing. It is obvious that there are many manuscript variants for Laozi. The leading category in Laozi is Tao, meaning the way. The first chapter about Tao serves as the general principle for his philosophy. Laozi regarded Tao as the origin of the universe. Tao is the unity of something, you, and nothing, Wu. Tao cannot be described as a square or as round because it has its uncertainties. As to the original form of 10,000 creatures, Tiandi Wanwu, in the world, we can name this as something, and from this something evolves this complex and colorful world. According to Laozi's philosophy, 
the way of heaven is praised, whereas the way of humanity is criticized. According to him, Tao evolves naturally into 10,000 creatures, and the heaven and the earth without God's power and without pretentiousness. Laozi states that T. He ways of men are conditioned by those of earth. The way of earth by those of heaven. The ways of heaven by those of Tao, and the ways of Tao by nature. The way of heaven does not argue, does not speak out, is not proud, and has no controlling desire. It is like a huge, invisible, boundless net, which covers everything yet is permeable. Compared to this, the way of humanity appears to be selfish, narrow, and unfair. Thus arises the problem. How can the way of humanity be transformed? Laozi replied, The way of humanity should follow the way of heaven. How can the way of humanity be made to follow the way of heaven? The operating principles and its applications of Tao must be analyzed. Laozi states one is the contestation and conversion of two opposites, the other is returning to its own origin. According to this principle, Laozi described the contestation and conversion of many opposites, such as strength and weakness, life and death, misfortune and fortune, up and down, front and back. He proposes that human societies should adopt the natural features of the way of heaven. Thus, the governors are made weak, and inaction is practiced. The governors ought to be simple, pure, not self-righteous, and not stubborn. They do not disturb the ordinary people and put themselves in ordinary people's shoes. Only if the way of humanity allows itself to be infiltrated by the way of heaven can it become invincible. To express this through Laozi's own philosophical language, this denotes action through inaction. Inaction here means to banish willfulness and autocratic action and to avoid acting impulsively. The Contentions of the Hundred Schools of Thought by Jia Zhengming during the Warring States period originated from different understandings of the relationship between the way of heaven and the way of humanity. The contemporary representative of Confucianism Mencius contended that once one understood the way of humanity, one will naturally understand the way of heaven. It can also be put in this way, the way of heaven as a magnified version of the way of humanity. Therefore, the major concern of his statements is the way of humanity. As for how to govern well, he has his own complete political ideology. See, Mencius Mencius, circa 372-289 BC, whose birth name was Meng Ke, was born during the middle of the Warring States period. He was a fourth-generation student of Confucius. Mencius received a good family education from childhood. When he reached adulthood, he went around all of the states in central China to expound his political ideology. During his last years, he returned to his home, the state of Zhou. This now refers to Zhou County in Shandong Province. There he collated his lecture materials and eventually wrote the book Mencius, Mengzi which has seven chapters. The policy of benevolence was the main content of Mencius's discussion of the way of humanity. This policy is people-oriented, which corresponds with Mencius's conviction that people should be the top priority, then the state, followed by the monarch. 
The primary objective of the policy of benevolence is to make the common people well off. The policy of benevolence relies on rule by man, namely, the governor's awareness and the measures they adopt. Mencius contended that ethics serves as the foundation to practice that policy. Mencius said that man by nature has four virtues. The first is sympathy, meaning to love. The second is a sense of shame, namely, the ability to feel embarrassment. The third is modesty, namely, being self-deprecating. The fourth is a sense of right and wrong, namely, being able to practice discernment. Mencius put forward the concept of Da Zongfu, which means the true man. He also set up the standard for this by saying, Neither riches nor honors can lead one astray, not to be shaken or modified by one's poverty or destitution, not to be subdued by force, this is the true man. One should not lose his will when he lives in wealth and comfort. One should not alter his personality in humble circumstances and through hardship. One should not discard his moral integrity in danger and when faced by threat. This is the real Da Zong Fu. Shun Ji, 298-238 BC was the representative of Confucianism during the late Warring States period. His statement of the relationship between the way of heaven and the way of humanity differs from that of Mencius. D. Shunji Shunji, whose given name was Kuang, and had the courtesy name Qing, was born in the state of Zhao. He went to the state of Qi when he was young. He came to the state of Qin upon the invitation of King Zhao of Qin in 266 BC and was impressed by the simple folk customs and good governance there. In 255 BC, he revisited the state of Chu. The Prime Minister Lord Chunshin of Chu gave him a position as the Magistrate of Lanoling, now Yi County in Shandong Province. He was dismissed from this position when the Prime Minister passed away. From then on, he lived, taught, and wrote the book Shunji in Lanoling. Shunji lived from about 298 BC to 238 BC, when the unification of all the states in central China was a sweeping subject. He studied the Hundred School of Thoughts and once presided over the Jisha Academy of the State of Qi. The proposition of the separation of heaven and man is itself significant in the history of Chinese thought. Shunji has in fact stated a truth here. When man grows out from nature and becomes a cognitive subject comparatively different from nature, this means separation. He can become a real man, not just a man in the general meaning of the word. This real man is not a slave of nature, he has his own ethics and consciousness, all of which makes him a perfect man. Shunji's statements on the way of heaven were influenced by Taoism, so he understands heaven as nature. The way of heaven equals the natural principles of nature. Regarding the way of humanity, Shunji retained the views of Confucianism to emphasize rights and the teachings of ethics and morality. Shunji's theory of the separation of the way of heaven and the way of humanity served as a basic foundation for the development of natural science in China and later became an important authority for followers of natural materialism. G. Zhuangzi Zhuangzi as a major representative of Taoism from the middle of the Warring States period. His statements about the way of heaven and the way of humanity are full of profound philosophical resonances. Zhuangzi 369-286 BC, whose given name was Zhou, was born in the town of Meng in the state of Song, now the northeastern part of Shangzhou, Henan province. He used to be a low-ranking official in his hometown, in charge of lacquer works. 
He went on to live the rest of his life like a hermit. He observed all of the things around him from a detached position. However, he made an in-depth study of the 100 schools of thought. He pondered various issues relating to nature and man and eventually completed the book named Zhuangzi. The book has a laid profound theoretical foundation and possesses unique features. According to scholarly studies, the inner chapter Neipian of Zhuangzi was composed by the philosopher himself. Meanwhile, the outer chapter Yipian and the miscellaneous chapters Zapian were written by the scholars after him. Zhuangzi further elucidated Laozi's natural law of heaven Daofa Zaran. For him, where qi congregates there will be life and where it disperses death is approaching, there is no maker of humankind, and there is no supernatural god who ordains his destiny. He thought that we should observe life and death according to the natural law. There is no need to feel happy and excited about life, and there is no need to feel heartache about death. Men can be freed spiritually if they can throw off their emotional manacles and view an issue from the natural law of change. Zhuangzi believed that Confucianism proposed rites and music which were against human nature. He regarded the natural part of human nature as being the whole human, thus negating the social aspects of human nature. This view is impartial. The historical achievement of Zhuangzi was to propose some contradictions between the way of heaven and the way of humanity from a philosophical perspective. In his view of the way of heaven, there is no distinction between creatures. As it is stated in the Adjustment of Controversies, Kiwalin, chapter from Zhuangzi, whether things are produced or destroyed. Dao again identifies them all as one. While from the view of the way of humanity, there are many differences among creatures. Zhuangzi raised a very important philosophical question, that is, relativism and absolutism in recognition. This proved the profundity and sharpness of Zhuangzi's thought. However, he abandoned relativism in favor of absolutism and insisted upon everything being the same and so does not exactly solve this philosophical issue. Zhuangzi reads another important philosophical problem in enjoyment in untroubled ease, Xiaoyang. That is the relationship between freedom and necessity. He named something that can exist under certain absolute conditions you die. He realized that everything in real life is you die. A rock can fly through the canopy of clouds at an altitude of 900,000 li from the South Sea to the North Sea with the help of his giant wings and the strong wind. Lai Zi rides delicately along on the wind. So is there anything that enjoys absolute freedom without depending on anything else? Only if a man abandons everything and immerses himself in nature can he reach the heaven of enjoyment in untroubled ease. F. Zhou Yan when talking about the way of heaven and the way of humanity in the warring states period, we cannot afford not to mention another school, namely, the yin-yang and five elements theory. The founder of this school was the thinker named Zhou Yan, 305 to 240 BC, from the middle and later stages of the Warring States period. This school was highly politicized. The school proposes that the five elements, Wu Da, of metal, Jin, wood, Mu, water, Shui, fire, Huo, and earth, two, are held in opposition and give birth to and restrain each other, the way of heaven. This explains the rise, downfall, and succession of dynasties, the way of humanity. Zhou Yan contended that the order of the succession of dynasties were as follows. Earth Virtue, Yellow Emperor, Wood Virtue, Yu the Great, Metal Virtue, King Tang of Shang, Fire Virtue, 
Duke Wen of Zhou, Water Virtue, Unknown, Earth Virtue, Unknown. Each dynasty represents one virtue. When one dynasty collapses, it will be replaced by another dynasty which represents the next virtue in the sequence. The Five Elements Theory, Wu De Zhongxi, as formulated by Zhou Yan was highly influential. The Qin Dynasty favored black, the Han Dynasty favored yellow. All of this demonstrates its ongoing influence. From the Han Dynasty onwards, the school of Yin Yang and the Five Elements theory still held considerable social influence.